know, the whole thing is what I like to do when I talk to guests is learn from them. Like I said, the whole point, like I, you're an open theist. I don't have many open theists on my channel. I want to know what their beliefs are. So that if I do actually one day want to challenge an open theist belief, I actually know what they actually, um, what their actual position is. And I'm not just straw manning them or something like that. I'm not trying to, I'm not trying to challenge every one of your beliefs tonight, but if you don't, if you just keep referring to somebody else's beliefs, somebody else's ideas, I'll never know what an open theist actually believes. So mm. that's all I'm saying. I just that, that when I ask these questions, it's not a gotcha or get you game. So you know, if you off. if you want me to set you up for open theism yeah. and understanding yeah. core open theism, it, it doesn't behoove us to jump to Genesis one creation ex nihilo or the virgin birth or something like that. We'd have to look more at uh, traditional open yeah. theist proof texts that they use against uh, classical theists, uh, Augustinian theists. And sure, so, we can do that. that whatever you want to talk about, that's what I'm trying. I, like, listen, we just come to that point in the yeah. conversation where I happen to bring that up. That's all I was doing. We got to the virgin. I'm just trying to distinguish differences. That was the whole original right. point of this conversation. At one point, what I was going for is to distinguish this difference between open theism and then maybe a traditional Christianity. And I just happen to bring that up based on something you had said. So yeah, so we, so we could talk about that. But one thing before we do that, I. I am very much more comfortable always stopping at that other level, authorial intent. That's my interest. That's what I care about, authorial intent. I, I leave it to individuals to come to their own conclusions about what, what data is presented. Again, as I wrote in my book that we can't assume the Bible's too true. We just need to understand what's in the Bible before we decide whether or not to believe it or not. And what, whether or not to believe it, that's just data interpretation rather than setting down evidence. Does so, that mis distinction oh, make no. sense? Well, it does to a certain degree, but I would say, though, just because the author has a certain intent and a certain message he's trying to get out doesn't make it true either. And that's what yeah. I was going to do. So, like, so when you, well, you listen, we could talk about what the author was intending. The author could be just dead wrong in what he was saying and simply just saying, like, well, the author meant it this way or the author meant it that way. Like, it doesn't get us anywhere. It's just saying, okay, the author just meant it. It does get us somewhere because, uh, okay. so, first so of all, one of the topics we were specifically talking about with the virgin birth, where does it get us? With authorial intent, we know that they believed in the authorial intent or not. But once you start asking people if they believe it or not, then you're talking about subjective evaluation of evidence. Well, of course, all like anything you do when you study the Bible is going to be subjective to some certain degree because it's got to mm -hmm. go through the filter of your brain and you've got to decide whether. Uh, you believe what the author, whether like, okay, there's the level of like, we can figure out what the author was intending to say, right? But then whether you believe what the author was intending to say is a whole nother level to it. And that's yeah. where the subjective part comes in. So uh, it, it, it's Josh, right? Dr. Josh? Yeah. Yeah. And so I don't know if you know this or not, but I have a whole video that I do on the Enuma Elish and I go over the Marduk uh, narrative. And I talk about reading comprehension and how to approach that text and interpret that text. And so uh, I think you might have brought it up into this conversation. But in the same way that I treat Enuma Elish, I need to be treating the Bible in the same fashion. I agree wholeheartedly. What's your seriological background? I'm sorry? What is your seriological background? Uh, well, I've I've uh, read a lot of uh, text. Uh, John Day's, uh, you know, Yahweh and the goddess, gods and goddesses of Canaan. Uh, Mark Smith, a lot of his texts are pretty good. Uh, I I read a lot of uh, ancient Near East type of stuff. Cool. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that would be the point that I would make, right? I mean, this is all about, and I, this is one of the things that I think, um, you know, scholars like John Walton are. I think, I think that's what they're trying to do. Again, I think that <clears throat> people bring up Walton uh, so often in evangelical circles, um, at least certain evangelical circles. Um, and I think there might be a slight over-reliance on his scholarship. But, but again, I think on, on the whole, I mean, I think he makes, I think he makes good points in his um, interpretive process for the most part, I think is, is pretty sound. I would, I would agree with it. Um, we carry what you just said further than you'd like me to carry it uh, because I treat the Bible as an ancient Near Eastern text. That's great. Um, that's, that's what we need to be doing. That's why everything you've said so far on this program, I've loved. Excellent. Um, I that you think, um, but I guess, I guess at the end of the day, um, I mean, I'm very, very excited to hear you say that. Uh, honestly, um, 
so I guess at the end of the day, what when Skylar brings people on here, I think, and again, Skylar, please correct me if I'm wrong. Um, the thing that he's trying to do is get at not so much an academic exercise into like, I, I don't think that he thought to himself, oh, you know, I'll bring you on here and I'll learn about what open theism is. Cause if you don't learn about open theism, we'll go read a book on it or something. But um, I think maybe what he was thinking is I'll bring him on here and I'll hear what he thinks about open theism, what he believes about it. Instead of doing that, what you're doing is you're saying, let me talk about open theism and all the different things that people think about it. Mm -hmm. um, maybe that's why it's frustrating. Skylar, would you say that's fair? Yeah, I think that's fair to certain degree. Well, I, I would say that uh, I approach the Bible differently than uh, most open theists and most Christians. I, I approach it in the ancient Near East setting. And so that's why you might get a false picture of open theism by talking directly to me and how I read the Bible and uh, how I see the text. And so we can I mean, set up. I, I hope I hope that that's not true. Uh, the first thing that you said, um, that most Christians don't approach uh, the Bible um, from an ancient Near Eastern perspective, because I think that most scholarly evangelicals, um, and not even evangelicals, most most scholarly people that uh, would profess Christianity do approach the Bible. Um, and maybe that's not what you meant. Maybe you meant like just they don't. What what they do? The number. What they do? If you read systematic theologies, I got basically every systematic yeah. theology ever written, and uh, what they do is they 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 try to read the Bible in light of systematics. And so they try to systematize the text and they, they grab out attributes like uh, omniscience. And so then they'll turn to texts like uh, uh, 1 John 2 or 3.20 where it says God knows all things. And they'll say, look at this. This is the metaphysical attribute of omniscience. This is ungenerated knowledge that God knows from all eternity about every single detail, no matter how minute. And they'll have lists of proof texts to prove prove their overarching metaphysics, which then they'll try to systematize back into the Bible. So John Calvin will turn to texts like Exodus 32, and we could turn to Exodus 32. And so what happens in Exodus 32 is you have God talking to Moses on Mount Sinai. And uh, God, God is infuriated that uh, Israel has turned away from him so quickly, and he's burning in wrath. And he says, Moses, get the heck away from me. I'm just going to kill all these guys. And Moses, thinking better, he says, no, God, don't destroy, don't destroy these people. These are your people that you're going to destroy. And then he lays down a systematic argument why God should not destroy the people. Uh, number one, he's got a promise to Abraham, an eternal promise to Abraham that he, he might not fulfill if he's destroying all of Israel. Uh, two, that, uh, that it is, is his people, that uh, he's the one who brought him out of Egypt. Uh, three, the argument is, if you kill them all, God, guess what? We just let all these people out of Egypt, and then they're all going to end up dead. And what will the Egyptians say? The Egyptians are going to look at you and say, you're some sort of death cult God. Your PR, your public perception is going to be ruined by you killing your, all your people. You know, I, there's more arguments in there. But actually, when you look at later interpreters of that text, of people looking back on that, like in Ezekiel and in the Psalms, that was the reason. And Ezekiel says, back then, I did it for my name's sake. I decided I repent. The text says that God repented. He changed his mind. He, he he's not all-knowing of all future events or anything like that. Moses used arguments to convince God to do something other than what God was going to do. And this, this theme is repeated throughout the Bible. And so what, they'll, what the systematizers will do in their systematic theologies, they'll say God has this attribute of omniscience, and then you turn to texts like this, and you have to understand them as, they'll dismiss them as anthropomorphisms, which is a made-up idiom. It's not an idiom that we're familiar with. When we think about anthropomorphisms, maybe it's like the brave little toaster. And the little toaster has eyes, and he's jumping around, and he's saving the day. And uh, what it is, is it's a framing device for fiction. And, and they won't claim that these events are fiction, but that this is condescending language. As John Calvin writes, that this is like baby talk, that, that we're so far below God that God has to speak to us in this sort of condescending way and tell us basically what's lies, things that, things that aren't actually true in order to, you know, get through to us lesser beings. And so there's the systematizers, which most Christians are those systematizers. They'll use their systematics to override individual stories rather than letting the stories 
free float in their own narrative context. Well, you you would have to agree, like through scripture. I mean, there is like Ephesians one eleven. All things are done according to God's plan and decision, and God chooses us to be His own people in union with Christ before, because of His own purpose, based on what He has decided from the very beginning. Like that's pretty clear that He's since from the very beginning He's chosen a plan for human beings and things like that. It seems like you would have to know some have some kind of foreshadowing of what's going to happen. Or, I mean, Jeremiah 1, five. before I formed you in the womb, I knew you before you were born. I consecrated you and I appointed you prophet of all nations. And so right. we'll, we'll turn to John Calvin again. Um, Calvin was actually a pretty good Hebrew scholar. And, and he, when he's talking about Psalms 139, he points out in the Hebrew conception, the formation of the womb, as the baby forms, we start as a unformed substance which gradually gets our body parts and so that's what's talk what they're, they're talking about in psalms 139 whereas before i was formed in the womb you knew me and then all my days or all my members is a valid translation john calvin writes this uh it's talking about fetology the development of a baby in the womb so in jeremiah prophet of nations part that's right there right so in in jeremiah jeremiah is not foreknown from thousands, millions of years back into eternity. He's being known from an unformed substance that's already conceived in the womb. That's that's what's going on there. That's the that's the Israelite idea of the formation of the baby. And so appointed you a prophet to the nations before you were born. Yeah. And God does so how, that. So he would know that he, he he designed him in a way that he'd be a prophet among nations. Right. And some prophets, like for example, nations without being with a seal of the future yeah i'll tell you how uh so jonah was also a prophet yeah, to the nations scripture also please go ahead so jonah was also a prophet to the nations and god said go be a prophet to the nation and he's like ah no i didn't need books it and he runs away and then god has to chase him down and then force him into the prophetic role and yeah. so th this this is not the idea that god knows all future events but god could have plans i could have plans I got a 100% prediction rate on my channel. All of the predictions I've ever made came true. And I'm not very powerful. I'm not very knowledgeable, I would say. But how does me, a mere mortal, predict the future, be able to do these things and say what what is going to happen in the future? It's because I have a little bit of power in order to make those types of things happen. And so someone can be chosen from birth for a particular role. That doesn't mean they have to accept the role. Uh, God says that uh, is, or, or in, in Romans 11, it says that Israel is God's elect, but they're enemies of the gospel. And so God's chosen nation became enemies of the gospel. It's not a fatalistic concept that's being communicated here. What does Ephesians want to look at? Wait a minute, hold on, real quick, real quick. Ephesians want to look at all things are done according to God's plan and decision. And God chose us to be his own people in union with Christ because of his own purpose, based on what he had decided from the very beginning. Right. So let's let's go over that verse. I have uh, podcasts on that verse, which goes over all those phrases and context. All right. <clears throat> so in him, we've obtained an inheritance. Who's we? He's talking about us in Christ in the current situation. I just want to point out. Sorry. I just want to point out. See, now we're. Now we're getting what you believe. This is this is what I wanted to say, and I think this is what Skylar was getting at. Yeah. Okay. So predestined here. Uh, if you go to there's there's a Greek library online that allows you to do text searches on the uses of words in the ancient languages, and predestined. Uh, I'm going to pull up some yeah. ancient uses of the word predestined, and you. While I'm doing that, how about you just you define the word to me? What does that word mean? We should go to Josh for this because he could speak Greek or knows a lot of Greek. I'm sorry if I'm putting you on the spot, Josh, with this one. Uh, but I'm just reading what it said. I mean, what, what translation would you like me to use? I can use whatever translation. No, what, like. what does the word mean? What, when you see that word, what what uh, concepts? Well, I, I don't know. In, in the description that I wrote, it didn't use the word predestination. It said, before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. And before you were born, I consecrated you. I appointed you in the prophet. Oh, sorry, that's Jeremiah. Yeah. Uh, uh, Ephesians. All things are done according to God's plan and decision, and God chose us to be his own people in union with Christ because of his own purpose, based on what he decided from the very beginning. I didn't use those words that you're asking about. Predestination. 
Yeah. So yeah. what what does the word mean? We're we're going over. I got the New King James pulled up. The New King James uses the Byzantine or majority text. Well, it means so. Here's the thing: what I get from Christians is you, Christians define it in many different ways to me. How they would define predestined. So that's why I think, like tell asking you like what my opinion is on the scripture. I don't think it says predestined necessarily in this scripture. I think it's talk. Well, I think it's some form of predestination. Like he's telling you what he's going to do with you. He tells you how he's planned it out before you're born. That's how it's referring to in this particular scripture we're talking about. Right. And so uh, hey, here's the thing. You brought up this proof text for a reason. I'm, I'm going to tell you it's, it's not a proof text. I got here. I'm pulling up on the screen. Uh, different uses of the word predestination in the ancient world. This is this is the word that's used in the verse. Okay, and well, uh, What translation are you using? So I can go to it real quick. We can look at it together. Um, for Clement? Well, you so you're saying it used the word predestination. Obviously, it didn't use the word predestination in the in the scripture that I quoted. What what that what um that was in the New King is, James, um, okay, Ephesians, so okay, so or on, go e ESV. Point. ESV also okay. uses it. Um, okay. Either Ephesians, or works. Let me go to it. So Ephesians one eleven. But the English word doesn't matter. Oh, hold on. We're gonna, well, I'm going to read it. We're going to read the King James version real quick because I think this is important so that we can see because I want to see it use the word predestination here. Uh, let's see here, King James, in whom we also we have or, or obtained an inheritance, being predestined according to the proposed purpose of his own work of all things in the counsel of his own will. Okay, go ahead. Okay, so predestination, if you take that Greek word that's used there, and it's used in both the critical text and the Byzantine text, predestination, here is Clement using that same word. And this is a great argument. If you're ever dealing with a Calvinist who thinks everything's predestined, they think it's a biblical concept, um, you could go to my website and you could uh, do a text search on uh, the use of the word predestination in the ancient world. This is Clement's use of the word. The second in order, and not any less than this, he says is, Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Consequently, God above thyself, and on his interlocutor inquiring, Who is my neighbor? He did not, in the same way with the Jews, specify the blood relation, or the fellow citizen, or the proselyte, or him that had been similarly circumcised, or the man who uses one and the same law. And so what, what yeah, reading that, without me telling you which word is the same word as predestination, which your original translation I think that's where you're getting this picked before time or picked from the beginning, uh, some sort of nonsense like that. But the same word used in Clement that I just read to you, which word, without looking, you can look at the screen, I guess. Yeah, I bolded the word on the screen. And what, uh, Okay, so what do you, then you, when you say, when we use the King James version, it says predestined. So just tell me what you mean then by predestined. Not me. I'm saying the use in the ancient world is just like specification. And so what's happening in Clement... Okay. Oh, the Jews context. I mean, help me understand what that means. Then, then a picking being, something or, or or defining something. It, it I mean, when it's we would use, no, it's not how we would use that defining something. So in, in, in that is who, I, Clement in, right in, here. We have say that again. So how would you use the word Clement? The Clement okay. uses the word to mean defining. And so what's happening in Clement with this word is so that the Jews. Point purpose of whom who worketh all things after the counsel of his own will no back to clement though how clement uses the same word uh, that's that's what i'm getting at so then once we know how this word is used in ancient context i got eusebius sorry certainly you're not you're not asserting that because clement uses it a certain way that that's what the word means no i'm not but okay. i will assert this i will assert that the translation which says that God foreordains things from before time began or before the foundation of the world, incorporating that meaning into the word uh, pro arizo, that's unwarranted. We have zero ancient texts that support that interpretation, and that's a complete fabrication by Christians who care more about their systematic theology than they do accurate translation of the text. So, so I guess the people who, who translate it in the King James Version the NIV, they have the wrong interpretation as they've written it. Well, the, the word predestination is, uh, comes from an uh, uh, English farming term, which means to set boundaries. And if you're using the traditional definition of uh, predestination in the farming sense, then it would be accurate. Uh, but words, of course, morph and have meaning. And a lot of times these meanings are assumed, like a Calvinist would do with this text. And the original translation that you read has the assumed meaning.
Okay, so articulate what it meant in the Greek then. So what were they trying to articulate in Ephesians 1.11? So in him, in God, we have obtained an inheritance. We've obtained an inheritance, uh, uh, salvation, or are looking forward to something in the future, being specified according to the purpose of him. So he, he chose the method, he chose the ways, or he might have even chose individuals, uh, doesn't give a real time frame here, who works all things according to the counsel of his will. And so what things are he is he working? Is he working all the leaves falling from the trees? Or is in context, is all things just all the things that God does, he does non-arbitrarily. So it, what is the overall context of Ephesians 1.11? What point is Paul trying to get at? What, what is he trying to teach his reader? Certainly he's not trying to say that all our events that ever happen were eternally forced by God. God controls every leaf. If, he, if that's his point, why is he telling his reader that? It, his, read, it, his reader is just an automaton in that case. Instead, his point is an assurance to his reader. He's trying to tell the, the re reader that uh, you, you are locked in, you're set, you're good to go. God has a plan. God has a purpose. What According to spirit will by what he wants. Yeah. And uh, so his, what... His plan, so, but his plan comes, so his will is going to happen, correct? Well, not always. Uh, like so, so things can happen not according to his will. But what, okay, so again, words are flexible. And so the question is, no, no, I'm just what, asking. No, 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 no. Can things happen not according to God's will? Yes and no. Again, not a yes or no, no. Yes, it's, it is. That's, that's a contradiction. No, it it's not. That's, you're not listening to me. You're not listening to me. But you're just, you're, you're contradicting yourself. Is a bat made out of wood? Is a bat, and it can be made out of metal. Yes, some bats are made there out of is? wood. There is? Really? Yeah. I saw one flying around the other day. That was made out of wood. Okay, I think what you're doing is being disingenuous now. To what no, we're actually what I'm, what the point I'm trying to get to is that there's, there's conflation of uh, different meanings of the word. And so what is Paul's point here? When it's he uses the word for plan. Can we just say plan instead of will? Yes, but... Okay, can things again, go against God's plan? Again, it's... it's yes uh, or no, can they go against God's plan? Yes and no. Now, are you, you going to listen to me? You're not going to listen to me. I, I want to listen to you, but you need to tell me... So it's not... yet. If the, Yes, they can go against his plan, that would mean yes. Then it could be yes and no in that sense. Like, yes, sometimes they can go against his will, sometimes they aren't going to go against his will. But it's not a yes or no, it's just a simple yes then. They can go against his plan. Yeah. And unless you're going to say different kinds of plan is your different kind of articulation of what you're trying to tell yeah. me here. Yes, that, that's what I'm, I'm, I'm trying to tell you. In, okay, so in the Bible, can he go, can people go against his plan? What kind yes. of plan does he go against? It Ab happens all the time. Uh, like, for example, in Luke, it says the lawyers resisted the will, which is the bulamite, the strong will of God, not being baptized by him. And it's in Luke. People resist God's will throughout the Bible. But that's not what Paul's talking about here. Uh, he's, he's not rejecting all the biblical texts in which uh, people resist God. Jonah flees from God. Jo God tells Jonah to go do something. He runs away, right? Uh, Israel, the whole, the whole story of the Bible is Israel continually rejecting God. God gets frustrated to the point where he says, you know what? I've done everything I could do to you. I, d I, d I don't know what else, how to get you to follow me. And so now I'm going to just destroy you because I've exhausted all my options. So people do oppose God's will, but that's not what he's actually talking about here. He's not talking about some uh, idea of a will struggle where, where man is now sovereign over God or anything like that. He's talking about God's ultimate plans, God's plans for a redemption of humanity, God's plans to bring about the kingdom of God. Yeah, that type of thing is not going to be thwarted. Uh, you got examples of God's, God's able to work around man's plans in the Bible. So John the Baptist, when he's confronted by the Pharisees, the Pharisees think that they are saved by virtue of being Israelites. Remember back to our Moses example. And so Moses, Moses argued that, God, if you kill all these Israelites, you're going to be reneging on your plan to Abraham. And that was a possibility that God would renege on his plan to Abraham. And so the Jews thought that God would never, ever destroy uh, all of the Jews because of this promise to Abraham. Uh, but John says, God, God is more innovative than you, you Pharisees. God could bring new children of Abraham from these rocks. And in that way, he could fulfill his plan despite you guys opposing his will. 
And that's the same type of concept going on here, that God has ultimate plans for a redemption, for an apocalypse in this context. Uh, Paul was an apocalyptic, and those plans aren't going to be thwarted. Individuals who God selects, and, and Paul has to talk over and over again to the individuals who are very disheartened, uh, he's saying that God, God is going to sustain you. All these bad things might happen to you, but God's overall plan will be achieved. Okay. Dr. Josh, any thoughts? <clears throat> yeah, I mean, um, you know, obviously I haven't, uh, I haven't taken time to uh, do a, a lexical study on Pro Arizzo, but, um, and I'm not suggesting necessarily that you're doing this, but I, I saw you point to one, maybe two, or go to point to a second uh, text that says, well, it doesn't mean to decide beforehand um, here. And so it can't mean it in Ephesians 1.11. That's that I said uh, the traditional, when a Calvinist comes to this text, when you pull up a systematic theology dictionary, it'll say that this word means that God, from timeless eternity before the world was created, chose something. And uh, that... You, you'll never find a context like that. You might find that word predestination along with the preposition from the foundation of the world, but from the foundation of the world is not presupposed in the definition of the word anywhere in the Bible and anywhere in uh, Christian ancient literature or secular ancient literature. I have some secular references as well. So, I mean, I'll just, uh, and again, this is, this is me just looking at Bowerdanker and Gingrich, which is, um, so, so before I even read this, I mean, of course, I, I'm sure that you realize this is probably one of the more debated um, uh, concepts in Christianity. So, I mean, I don't, I don't know how fair it is to say um, or to at least imply that um, you have the answer uh, and the reason that everybody else has gotten it wrong is because of some bias that they have. That might not have been what you meant, but that's how it came across. Um, so I'll just read what Bauer, Denker, and Gingrich, uh, BDAG, for those of you that study Greek, um, for Arizzo, uh, the definitions that they give when it relates to God are to decide upon beforehand to predetermine. Um, so, I mean, are you comfortable with that definition to decide upon beforehand? Um, that, that is one definition and that's a fine definition. But, but some, some, uh, theological dictionaries tack on decide from before the foundation of the world. And so they presuppose their idea of God having this eternal decree, which created the entire world, spawned everything into existence. And anytime the word predestination is used pro riso that's that concept. And I'm, I'm saying, and, and yes, I, I will affirm what you're saying of me, that I'm saying that those people who claim that, they're absolutely wrong. Because in my article here, I have every single use uh, that's indexed, of course, of this world word used in the ancient world. In the ancient world. And so we can go to each uh, occasion or instance and see if that interpretation, that eternal predestination from outside of space and time, if that's warranted by any context anywhere where that word's used. It's just not. And so individuals uh, imposing that definition on pro Arizo, uh, they're they're making it up. So, okay. Um, we just actually went through this in a video. Um, so in the Hebrew, um, we don't have to stop. The, the word Anan, the PL, you know, it takes on different meanings depending on who the subject is, depending on who the object is. I mean, this is how linguistics works, right? This is how language works. Um, so are there examples that you would cite where God is the agent? God is the the subject of the verb praorizo in those in those texts that you're citing. Yeah, yeah, God, God does uh, predestined things. That's that's typically the use in uh, the New Testament. It, it's there's other words in which he's not always the subject. Uh, the foreknowledge, when foreknowledge is used, uh, Paul uses it of of the uh, the Jews who knew him previously. But pro proorizo, God's always the subject. And so, decide. <clears throat> maybe I don't understand. Um, 
what you're saying. So Arizzo, Arizzo is like um, to mark out, to demarcate something, to select something, to determine something. I'm trying to remember all the different ways yeah. that I've seen that used. So pro in front of it is, you know, like beforehand um, or before or in front or whatever. I mean, it's a preposition that can mean a bunch of different things. And not that we want to fall into the trap of necessarily tying two parts of a word together and determining the meaning, but um, I guess I guess my question is, again, not having done any lexical work on this at all, um, just thinking it through as you say it, it sounds like you don't like uh, predetermine. Well, there's what happened is a word hijacking. Um, Calvinists have taken words like uh, sovereignty, uh, election, they've hijacked. When, when the Bible talks about the elect, what it's talking about is like, when you look in the ancient uh, texts, it's it's the choice. You grab your choice soldiers for the attack. You're not, you know, randomly picking people in arbitrary merits. You get your choice grapes to make your wine. And so they'll take words like elect, uh, predestination. They'll take uh, words like foreknowledge, and then they'll 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 in they'll add on their own definition and they'll hijack the word. And then when we come as English readers to these words. And we're only familiar with what the Calvinists say about these words. We tend to, uh, as a matter of course, just interpret it in the way that they've already interpreted it without giving it critical thought. So, well, I mean, I don't, so yeah, I mean, I don't I'll disagree for a moment. Um, it sounds like you're reacting to you, the open theist movement is reacting to that in such a way that it, it maybe, it seems like it might be going to a different extreme. Um, so one of the things, uh, just strictly from the ancient Near East, um, not strictly, but from the ancient Near East in general, is one of the things that was, um, you know, unique about deities is, is their ability to predict uh, things that would happen in the future. Um, you know, I mean, it was a bad time in the ancient world to be a goat uh, because, you know, you had uh, you had judgments that were deemed. Uh, or determined by deities, and that doesn't necessarily mean that it was a it was an irrevocable, um, you know, fixing of a of a particular event. Um, certainly, uh, omens by their very nature uh, were were um, formulated in a way that they could be counteracted by non or um, you know any other uh, number of uh, of rituals. Um, but so, you know, f as an example, something that's, that's major that more, maybe more people know about when an eclipse took place, um, at least in the new Assyrian period, this, you know, d indicated that the king was going to die. Right. And so, um, you had the substitute king ritual that was taking place. And, and the idea was that the gods were giving an unprovoked sign by putting this eclipse, uh, in the sky. And if, if that happened, that was, it was foretelling in a sense, the future, right? If, if. If you don't do anything differently, this is what's going to happen. And so, um, of course, the king then would have the substitute king come in or the substitute queen. And, um, you know, then the, the gods could fulfill that, you know, prediction, uh, fulfill that uh, whatever that they determined in the past on that substitute king. But that, I mean, that was sort of the point. So, you know, when you read Isaiah, you read Isaiah and you... You know, you see these things about uh, I've, I've I've said these things would happen before and they've come to pass. Um, I mean, I don't know that it's something that we should so easily. And I'm not saying you personally, but um, maybe maybe it's not so easy to write off the idea that um, that God has knowledge of the future in whatever nuanced sense that we might have it. Okay, yeah. so. Uh, are you familiar with the book, The All-Knowing God by Petazzoni? I'm not. Okay, so he's an ancient scholar of religions. He went around, and uh, I could pull up his book. I, I bought it, and then I scanned it, so I got a digital copy. But uh, he goes over all sorts of different uh, religions around the world. He's probably got 50 different examples. And he talks about the omniscience in each of these religions, what kind of omniscience they were. Um, how did those gods achieve those that omniscience, whether or not that omniscience was magical omniscience and uh, whether it's a line of sight omniscience, what, what type of omniscience is it? And his conclusion about Yahweh, a God of the Bible, uh, is that Yahweh has a visual omniscience with particular respect to 
individuals, human beings. So it's, it's a present watching, and that's what's described in the Bible. On top of that, on top of that, I've already thrown out the name Christine Hayes, Yale University Old Testament scholar, and she too would admit that there's no concept of omniscience in the Hebrew Bible. But talking about Isaiah real quick, I think there's a definite misreading uh, from Isaiah 40 through roughly 48 around Deutero Isaiah, we'll say, uh, Deutero Isaiah, which uh, what's happening there is a trial of the false gods. And so the, who's the audience? The audience is exiled Israel, who's turning to false gods. And uh, the author, what his goal is to do is to convince them that Yahweh is the true God and other gods are the false gods. And so he sets up this contest. And the contest is not a knowledge contest. It's not a Jeopardy contest where, oh, whoever answers the most right questions and whoever has the most head knowledge about facts, that's the God who's going to win. Instead, it's actually power claims what's going on there. And he leads, he leads off this section with, uh, you know, look at the things that I did. I brought you out of Egypt, for example. And then he starts talking about, you know, you're only in this captivity because I said I was going to put you in this captivity, and then it did happen. And so when he's talking about I said it and then it came to pass, he's not talking about I'm using predictive features to uh, know knowledge about the future. Instead, he's saying, I'm a powerful God who could bring about what I say I'm going to do. And then he says, I'm going to tell you something new. And uh, then he tells him, them what he's going to do for them in the future. He's going to lead them out of captivity. And so the, a lot of times people read this and they think it's some sort of knowledge claim. It just it doesn't fit the context of what's going on there, a knowledge claim. Rather, it's a power claim going on. Uh, I could tell you the future because I can do the future. Hey, we can't hear you, uh, Josh. Uh, yeah, so I don't, I don't know that I would necessarily disagree with that. Um, but I, I think that discounting um, on the whole prophetic texts uh, or even the prophetic genre um, simply because there's an aspect of, uh, of power behind it, even a strong aspect of power behind it, um, would be a little too hasty. But what kind of knowledge is it? Is it Nostradamus? knowledge is it looking in a crystal ball to see the events that you know are going to play out as a movie you see what's going to happen in the future and then you tell people about that movie that you foresaw that's the type of knowledge that uh, individuals christians typically ascribe to yahweh oh, yeah. no in the question. bible no question no, no, i don't disagree with you at all right and so most prophecy claims number one prophecy Typically, the purpose of prophecy is to avert prophecy. So back to Christine Hayes, she, she talks about the prophet and the role of the prophet. And the prophet's role is to tell Israel what God's current plans are based on current circumstances. And that's subject to change based on the circumstances. And so yeah. Jonah will tell Assyria. Yeah, I, don't think, I, don't, I don't think that there's, I don't think that there's a lot of people that would, that's, that's not new. Um, and I suspect Christina Hayes is talking about that because that's a pretty common understanding. Um, you know, these are these are acts, these prophetic acts. Uh, uh, there's it's you know speech act theory. I mean, so, um, but I don't think that this is the problem that I think I see with. Uh, I keep I hate to keep pecking on it, but I mean, just because he's come up and it's what I'm thinking of now. Um, you know, somebody like John Walton. I think that he's got a good idea about Genesis one. Uh, I think it's very clear there's a lot of literary organization that's going on in Genesis 1, but to take it to the extent that there's no creative act that's being, um, that, that it's all organization, that it's not uh, creative, I think it's just taking it a step too far. Um, yeah, so, so the question always is, what type of knowledge? My knowledge of what I'm going to do in the future, that's, that's knowledge based on my capabilities, my actions, what I could bring forth, my knowledge of how the world works and operates. A Nostradamus type of knowledge of the future, that's more of looking into a crystal ball to see what definitely will happen. Yeah, which... I, don't th I don't think those, sorry, I don't think that those two things are mutually exclusive. So for example, if you look at Daniel, I mean, part of the, part of the thing about Daniel, particularly Daniel 10 and 11, is that, um, particularly Daniel 11, is that there's such specificity in the text about what's going to happen and i mean tell verse 40 and it falls apart well but but the, the i think 
specifically speaking with the the um the grecian empire of course it, i mean of course it falls apart because it's a text that's written in the second century but um but i think that when um when you think about the nature of daniel um and you think about how uh the prophet is is uh, the prophet daniel is calling um his people to um, stand fast and to take heart and those sorts of things um and he's doing so on the understanding that this ancient text has uh, predicted the events that have already taken place. And of course, that doesn't mean that God didn't orchestrate those things. I mean, I think that's the whole point is that God orchestrated them. But um, the nature of that specificity, I think, is is the point, right? That, that not only does he know what's going to happen, he knows it because he's going to bring it about. Yeah, you, maybe that's you are, what you're saying. You are 100% correct. And there's there's two ways open theists deal with Daniel 11. And I'll, I'll give the more popular version before I give my version. Uh, the more popular version is uh, God can make all these things happen where, uh, you know, different kingdoms are going to rise and they're going to have different temperaments because he, he makes those things happen. Um, my version is a little bit different. Daniel didn't write Daniel 11. Um, that was written to, uh, uh, during maybe the time of the Maccabees. And the, the literature, the genre type is apocalyptic. And so when you look at ancient Hebrew texts, there's all sorts of apocalypses that float around. There's the, the apocalypse of Adam and there's apocalypse of uh, Elijah or whoever. There's a lot of apocalypses. And so just the genre type, uh, people tend to understand that the claimed author is not really the actual author. And so it was written... Uh, all the events that happened up till verse 40 were in the past. And the reason it falls apart at verse 40 is because then it goes from very specifics, things that are easy to talk about in the past, to future prophecies of this uh, coming apocalypse, which did not happen. It did not happen. And so Christians generally have a huge problem going on with Daniel 11 and 12 because the prophecy did not occur and they'll still claim that it's future, which it was not meant to be. It's supposed to be occur during the time of the Maccabees. All right. We've hit our two hour mark and I got to get off here and spend some time with my wife. This was a fantastic conversation. Christopher, I appreciate you coming on, man. Uh, I think this is a good convo. And uh, for being so open and, and being able to discuss these topics, really smart dude, knows his stuff, has been researching it. Um, I'm going to say goodbye and thank you. I'm going to put a link to your channel in the description. Actually, you mostly do podcasts, if I'm correct, right, Christopher? Yeah. I, I was gone, yeah. Uh, I, I do the off, off video making fun of James White. So if you guys hate that guy, if you hate Matt Slick, if you, put in, if you Google Matt Slick, <laughs> my videos are the first to come up showing how he's a liar and a scum <laughs> human being. All right. So what we'll do is I'll put a link to your YouTube channel, but send me a link to your podcast too. That way I can put it in the description. Uh, and we'll say goodbye to you, Christopher. Thank you so much for hanging out. It's good talking to you, man. Dude, yeah, it was a pleasure. Thank you. Awesome hanging out with you. You have a good night, man. We really appreciate it.